So this idea of dynamics, which we look at in extension two, which kind of pulls all the calculus together. I mean, this really was the origins of calculus, so they could study motion. Newton's laws of motion, however, and here it is in the original Latin, ah, corpus omni preservari in statu. Okay. <laughs> So the first law, everybody continues in a state of rest or uniform motion in a right line unless it's compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it. That's basically saying that we're going to have a constant velocity unless there's some force or acceleration applied to us. That's all that's really saying. Law two, probably the most famous of them all, Newtonian motus proportionalium. The change of motion is proportional to the motive force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line. So again, we're talking about straight line motion, which the force is impressed. And I say it's the most uh, familiar because what it's saying is this. The motive force is proportional to the change in motion. So force is proportional to acceleration. So it's equal to some constant times acceleration and we play around with it, and that constant turns out to be the mass. So force is equal to mass times acceleration. Law three, ah, actioni contrarium semper et aquelium, SC, reactionium, civi corporum duorium actions in si mutoiu semper SC. I, I didn't do Latin, can you tell? Often quoted as uh, to every action as an equal and opposite reaction, but the uh, actual translation is to every action there's always opposed an equal reaction, or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed in contrary parts. We shall see what this all means when we're drawing up our force diagrams, but what that basically is saying is the forces are always in balance. I suppose that's, that's my summary of law three. The forces are always in balance. So this idea of acceleration, because force is mass times acceleration, becomes quite important. We have already seen at a two-unit level, when we first looked at it, that it was the second derivative of displacement with respect to time, or the first derivative of velocity with respect to time. So that's when acceleration was a function of t. We then went and looked at this idea of ddx of a half v squared, which was useful when acceleration was a function of displacement. But when we went and proved that, in one of the middle lines we ended up with this, v dv dx. And that actually is quite useful when acceleration is a function of velocity, or we, we want to get some sort of link between velocity and displacement. Very, very, very old question, 1981. This is back in the days before they uh, used to break it down into parts and all this. Do not panic. They are not like this anymore, but it's fun. Let's have a look. Assume that the Earth is a sphere, radius capital R, and that at a point little r, which is bigger than capital R, strange, you would have thought it was the other way around, but there you go. From the center of the Earth, the acceleration due to gravity is proportional to one on little r squared directed towards the Earth's center. A body is going to project, be projected vertically upwards from the surface of the Earth with an initial speed capital V. <coughs> Prove that it will escape the Earth if and only if that that velocity is greater than or equal to the square root of 2gr, where g is the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity at the Earth's surface. I like to draw diagrams. They will be very useful. In fact, what we call force diagrams will become almost necessary in order to solve these problems. But in case you haven't worked it out, the blue circle is the Earth. Okay. And the red line, that's where I'm going to be projecting along that particular red line. There's my particle that's being projected. We'll call him Bob. Good old Bob. We know at the Earth's surface, then displacement, and they're using R for displacement rather than X, R is equal to capital R. That velocity was capital V. And we've just been told that the acceleration due to gravity is G, in acting towards the centre. 
So we're going to give, make that the negative direction. And it'll go up, and at some point it'll stop, and velocity will equal zero. Okay, I'm going to draw my forces in. When I draw a force diagram, I decide which direction I'm going to make positive. In this case, going up, I'm making positive. That is the direction of what we call our resultant force. And I'll go back to law three. All the forces will balance. So every force we put on this diagram will equal the resultant force. It is the result of all the forces acting on the object, the way of thinking of it. So MR double dot, resultant force, isn't an actual force by itself. It's just the sum of all the forces acting on the object. And so what forces are acting on the object? Well, there is the force due to gravity, which they said was proportional to 1 on R squared. Now, uh, well, sorry, they said the acceleration was proportional. Now, the acceleration is proportional means it's equal to some constant. That constant I've called mu, the Greek letter mu. But a force is mass times acceleration, so it'll be mass times mu. Any other forces acting on this particle? No, because it's just a simple projectile. We're just projecting it from the Earth's surface. The only force we saw, that in three in it, uh, is our force due to gravity. So I now know all the forces will sum to give m mu on r squared. It's negative because it's in the opposite direction to my resultant force. Well, we like to work with acceleration, so the first thing I do is divide both sides by the mass. And there's my acceleration formula. Acceleration is minus mu on r squared. Acceleration is in terms of displacement. In terms of displacement. Now I can work out what mu is because I've been given some conditions that when little r is equal to capital R, the acceleration is equal to minus g. So I'm going to work out what mu actually is. Mu works out to be g capital R squared. So here's my formula now. Acceleration is minus g, capital R squared, over little r squared. So I'm going to use ddx of a half v squared. Well, ddr in this case, because we're using r for displacement. So a half v squared will be g r squared on r plus a constant, integrating both sides. Multiply both sides by 2. Now I need some information that links velocity and displacement together to work out my constant. And in the question, we were told uh, that when R is capital R, V is equal to capital V. Sub that in, and I get V squared minus 2GR for the actual constant. So there's my expression for velocity squared. I now have a formula for velocity squared in terms of displacement. Now, what do I know? If the particle never stops, remember I said it'll, when it stops, the velocity will equal zero. But if it stops, then it's going to come back. But this is the escape velocity we're trying to work out. I don't want it to come back. I want it to escape the Earth's atmosphere. So I don't want it to stop. So displacement will go off to infinity. So R will approach infinity. So the limit of v squared as r approaches infinity. Well, r's on the bottom of the fraction there, you'll notice. Everything else is just constant. So it's v squared and 2gr and so on. So the limit would be v squared minus 2gr. But v squared is always greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, v squared... <laughs> Unfortunate choice of pronumerals. Little v squared right, is our velocity. So little v squared is always greater than or equal to zero. So capital V squared minus 2gr is greater than or equal to zero, which means capital v, whoop, capital v squared is always greater than or equal to 2gr. So therefore, if capital V is greater than or equal to the square root of 2gr, my particle is never going to stop. In other words, the particle escapes the Earth. Thus, that is my escape velocity, which they wanted me to work out. As I say, it was a very old question, 
these days it would be worded a lot differently uh, to, to come up with this sort of answer. But it's using the idea of limits. We're now going to give it that escape velocity. We're going to assume V is indeed the square root of 2GR. We're going to prove that the time taken to rise to a height of capital R above the Earth's surface is this beautiful expression. All right, so little v squared is equal to 2g capital R squared. Look what happens. They've actually simplified the problem for us because if capital V is equal to the square root of 2gr, I can simplify this formula down. And the formula now is simply v squared is 2gr squared on r. I'm going to say v is the square root. It can't be negative because remember this particle is never returning. So it's never going to have a velocity of coming back down. So I've taken the positive square root. So dr to t is equal to that square root. Why did I choose dr to t? I'm trying to now get a link between displacement and time. So the t dr, turn it upside down, integrates. So our time will be, I'm going from the Earth's surface, that was when x was equal to capital R, to a height to uh, r above. So it's another r. So I'm going for r to 2r. Earth's surface was r. We're going to a height r above that, so I'm going to a displacement of 2r. Integrate roots r, I get 2 thirds r to the 3 on 2, which of course is r root r. Now, subbing in then, I've taken the 2 thirds out, but also 2 cancels with the root 2, so that's why I now have root 2 on 3 root gr squared. In the bracket, sub 2r in, I'll get 2r root 2r. Minus sub r in, I get r root r. Factorise, I've taken out r root r. I'm left with 2 root 2 minus 1. Put the root 2 back in, I get 4 minus root 2. r cancels with the r, and I have root r. And we're almost there with what we want. I'm now saying a third. 4 minus root 2 of root r over g. That is the answer we were looking for, for our question. You'll notice I've only put three questions there out of, of eight. C.